All right, so uh, tonight, tonight is uh, trying to evaluation of all values, weight, weigher, and measure. Um, but before that, I want to announce that this summer, because I'm stupid, um, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do a 16-part series. So once a week, Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. at the barn at Fen River. You've got a flyer there. And it's, this is going to be the history of philosophy in 16 weeks. I'm going to do the Western tradition, the Indian subcontinent tradition, starting with the Harappan civilization, Chinese civilization, and I'm going to do one session on the Mesoamerican philosophical tradition, about which we know virtually nothing. Uh, but we know enough. We do know enough to, to do an overview of the Mesoamerican tradition, the pre-Columbian philosophical centers of the Aztecs, the Mayas, and Incas, etc. We do have some of those texts actually survived, either in transcription or actual original texts. And so this will be like try to do sort of the global history of philosophy in 16 weeks from the beginning of man till today. So how hard could that be? Uh, so yeah, so you're invited to come out there. Finn River, beautiful, of course. Uh, should be fun. And, and, it, and it's going to be a little more focused on the lecture, but then I'm going to have handouts that really sort of have more questions and guidance and then some breakout groups afterwards for discussion. So hopefully make it sort of more convivial, more of a party, more everything. So that's the idea of philosophy in the barn. And second, um, people keep asking for these handouts online, so I just want to say you guys have them because you're here, but if you're online, I'm going to link to my Instagram account so you can just get a picture of the handout. Uh, so they'll be up there now, easier to get to. Um, all right, so tonight, weight, weigher, and measure. So we've been talking. Did you turn the recorder on? I think, did I turn the recorder on? Yes, I did. I did. Thank you. That's an excellent dialogue, because I would miss that for sure. Um, the, um, we've been working on this notion that values are changing. We're, they're, uh, they're under threat. They're, 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 they're morphing. And the last two lectures, I suggested one place that we might look for new values is from the African American community, which is this carries this tradition from West Africa that I thought might be interesting. Um, and tonight I want to go to what I think is the, actually the most important answer that is related to the last two lectures, and that is you have to look to you. You have to be the weight, weigher, and measure. You are the scale of all meaning and value. This is an incredibly challenging and difficult task, yet I think it's the central and most necessary step in the transvaluation of values. And, and there's a story that encapsulates this just beautifully, and this is Langston Hughes, one of our great poets, um, highly educated, primarily self-educated, a huge, huge reader. And so what he's reading is the, is the Western classical tradition, of course, and he got a job on a ship that went to Africa. So he is beside himself with joy. He's like, one, I'm getting out, which he's really happy about, and I'm going to Africa. And he's just like, this is blowing his mind. Like, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Working my way to Africa, it's going to be amazing. And it was amazing for him. And so when he packed up, he packed all these books. He packed all these books with him, all the classics. And he's an incredibly literate man, of course. I mean, obviously, Langston Hughes. Um, and... When the ship starts chugging out the New York Harbor to go to Africa, he goes, what am I doing? Why am I carrying the old, the tradition that is not me? The all? And he throws it all overboard. He says, I'm going to liberate myself. And he said, it felt like a million pounds dropping off of me, or a million bricks or something. Just, just, this weight was relieved, except for Walt Whitman. He didn't throw Walt Whitman overboard. <laughs> he said, no, 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 you got to keep Walt. So this is being the weight, weigher, and measure. He knew the value of the great Western tradition. He read it. He would studied it, informed his mind. But he said, I'm going someplace new, and I don't want to carry this with me. It's not that it's bad or evil or wrong. It's just not for me and not now except for Walt Whitman. The guy I'm taking with me is America's great poet of freedom, Walt Whitman. And so he headed out with his own values. In fact, in a way, he headed out to discover his own values. And there's so much there that, because he, he, he recognized it and said, this is not good for me now. 
I'm going to put this down. Well, actually, I'm going to put it in the harbor, but you know, I'm, I'm going to set down, even though everybody else says it's great, and I acknowledge that it's great. We always think of, oh, putting down poisonous things and evil things and bad things, right? That's easy in a way. But to put down things that we think are good and have nice qualities and, and, and do in some way are valuable. Ah, now, see, this is hard in some ways. But we like to harbor that, keep it. And he said, no. But then he did say, ah, but I'm going to keep Walt. Because notice the other thing he could have said is like, no, I'm an African-American. I'm going to Africa, the motherland. There's nothing here for me. I'm breaking off, throwing it all away, free my mind. That wouldn't have been true either. You can go to Africa for 100 years. You're never going to find Walt Whitman because he's not there. Right? And he knew that. And so that, you know, there was no, it wasn't a cant, it wasn't a program, it wasn't a, a political position. It was what he thought he needed for him. So this is the core of being the weight, wear, measure. And it's really, really freaking hard. And I don't want to say it's not, but it doesn't mean it's not necessary, right? Because I do think it is necessary. Um, one of the things we're up against here, as, and this is the first quote, is there's been a recent move in pseudoscientific uh, circles. If you like science, you generally despise psychology research. Because there's no worse science than psychology research. We sampled four people, and one of them did this. Therefore, and you're like, what are you talking about? I mean, their sample sizes are off. They're, they're just, they do such bad research so consistently, it's just irritating. But there's been this movement in psychological circles to prove, quote unquote, that we do not have free will. And it's important to note that if you do not have free will, you cannot make your own values. This is what not having free will means. It means you're an automaton. It means you're a machine of some kind. You can be a chemical machine, a DNA machine, an information machine, but it means you don't have free will. In fact, interestingly, if we create artificial intelligence, We'll be in a position where social scientists, some of them, bad ones, are arguing that computers have free will, but we don't. Which would be like, it's going to be really sort of, I think that's not going to hold water, but that's where we're sort of moving that direction. And they say, oh, you know, we, this, all of this, you know, our way we think is not the way we think we think and all this. And some of this research is great, by the way. William James did much of it. Um, and if you read the principles of psychology, that's really good research. But it was written 100 years ago, and I rarely encounter anything that makes me think that we've done better since then. I'm, I'm, I'm totally serious about that. If you read the principles of psychology, you'll, you'll see in the news or whatever, a report will go, oh, this amazing discovery. It's like James had, was using research from Germany 100 years ago that talked about that. What do you guys, you know? And he am amalgamated into a concept. But so here's one I just picked randomly. I just actually searched no free will and hit the news button on, on Google. And boom, 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 boom. Right here it comes. It's all coming up. They're trying to convince us of this. Don't fall for this. <clears throat> so it remains to be seen just how much the post-dictive illusion. So this is the idea that our brain tricks us into thinking retrospectively that we made a decision when in fact we had not. So it's post-dictive. So instead of predictive, post-dictive in the other direction. Uh, I actually kind of like that word posted. Anyway, of choice that we observe in our experiment connects to these weightier aspects of daily life and mental illness. The illusion may only apply to a small set of our choices that are made quickly and without too much thought. Or it may be pervasive and ubiquitous, governing all aspects of our behavior from our most minute to our most important decisions. Most likely, the truth lies somewhere in between these extremes. By the way, that is a logical fallacy. Uh, the notion that if you have two positions, the truth lies in the middle of that. It's like if somebody says there's one planet in our galaxy or, or in our solar system and somebody else says there's a hundred, then it's 50. No, this is no, this is not, really, this isn't how scientific reasoning works. I assure you, that's not what, the, it's just not, the, it's like, oh, probably lies in the middle. No, there's no reason to suspect that. Um, anyway, <clears throat> most likely the truth lies somewhere in between these extremes. Whatever the case may be, our studies add to a growing body of work suggesting that even our most seeming ironclad beliefs about our own agency and conscious experience can be dead wrong. Absolutely. Our ideas about our own conscious experience can be dead wrong. They can also be really accurate. 
If they were always wrong, this would not be a problem because we wouldn't be here. Any species who is always wrong in their understanding of the world survives a very short period of time, particularly when you have other species trying to kill them. Right? One way to understand modern humans is we're the humans who survived all the other humans. Right? Think about this. Our cultures, our civilizations, our tribes, our groups have been striving not just with the natural world, which was a big problem for the first you know, million years, but with other human groups. And if you're wronger than the other human groups, they eat you, essentially. They take your stuff, conquer you, and convert you to their system. That's the history of mankind in a nutshell. I mean, that's really, truly, honestly, that's not you. You lose if you're, in, if you're insufficiently correct about the way the world seems to work. You know, goodbye. Sorry about that. Uh -uh. So that, you know, so this notion that we're, we can be wrong, by the way, they're accurate. We can be wrong, but we're not that wrong. And we're not that wrong all the time. But I just highlight this because there is this movement, oh, it's all psychology or it's all, you know, training or whatever. Yes, I mean, all those things are true. They do influence us. But we're not automatons. And the counterexample I would use to the, to the dubious psychological research, there's also much great psychological research, by the way, but there's a lot of just pop research. This is terrible. Um, is the entire industry of marketing the entire industry of marketing is premised on the notion that you can choose and we want to influence that choice in any way possible. And hundreds of billions of dollars are spent every year under the assumption that you have agency. Because if you didn't have agency, marketing would not work. If you're an automaton, like you can, you can market to a tree. You can hold a sign up to a tree that says, buy McDonald's, and the tree does not respond. It's not subject to marketing, because it doesn't have agency in the way we do. And so it, given a choice between pop psychological research and a, a multi-100 plus billion dollar a year industry, I'll go with them. They've done a lot of research, and they believe we can make choices, and they're desperate to influence them. In fact, that's one of the problems, is we live in a society where we have all of these really smart people with lots of resources trying to shape our agency. If we didn't have agency, it would be pointless. It wouldn't matter. But we do, I would argue. Um, and therefore, yeah, we're in trouble. But the primary form of agency is to create your own values, is to do a Langston Hughes. This is not for me, even if it's good. This is for me. That's, that's, that fundamental decision is really, really hard for us. So we're going to do a lot of James tonight just because he's topical for this. So I said, why not? Let's do a lot of James. Uh, so he said here, he said, out of crisis. He said, I, was think, I, I, I think that yesterday was a certain crisis in my life. I finished the first part of Renoir's second essay and see no reason why his definition of free will, the sustaining of a thought because I choose to when I might have other thoughts, need be the definition of an illusion. So, so there was this, again, this notion of free will has been fought for a lot of years. One of the problems is it's a metaphysical question, and it's, you just basically can't answer metaphysical questions. They're unanswerable. And so James's answer to this, at any rate, I will assume for the present, until next year, that it is no illusion. My first act of free will shall be to believe in free will. So if it's a metaphysical question, just feel free. So I'm just going to go with James on this and go, my first act of free will, be believe I have free will, until there's a whole, whole lot of evidence to convince me otherwise. And so far, there really isn't. And then James goes on in a later different work and says, um, the greatest revolution of our generation is the discovery that human beings, by changing our inner attitudes of their minds, can change the outer aspects of their lives. So this, this discovery, this is the core of the, the, what I would say is the good, good part of the psychological research. This is the great stuff. Where they, the research just showed over and over again, and continues to show, by the way, that we can, by the application of our will, change both how we think, and when we change how we think, we change both the internal and, to a certain extent, the external aspects of our lives. This is profoundly powerful. And he thought, he's just thought it was the, the, the greatest insight. Um, and so this is the key. This is the idea. If, if you can do that, if you do have free will, 
then you should. But uh, it's troublesome. And here's the problem. First, so you're born, congratulations. You're born with about 100 billion neural connections. Today, you have about 100 billion neural connections. But they're just wired very differently. The first three, four, five years of your life, your mind is rewiring itself, forming neural connections, forming neural networks, reinforcing some, editing others out at a spectacular rate, millions and millions and millions of times every couple of minutes for the first several years of your life. Your, the infant brain is essentially on fire. I mean, that thing is doing incredible. And so all kinds of deep layers of behavior influence ideas, language, for instance, sound, food, smell, taste, this all gets wired at a very fundamental level. And then your brain is always plastic, but to a certain extent, it, the core sort of solidifies. And then for the rest of your life, you're modifying, changing, working with that core. What this means is you go through your life thinking with a brain that was developed when you were five. This is challenging. <laughs> right? It's not that that's the limit, it's just that at your core, you're still a five-year-old. I'm still a five-year-old. We still have this wiring of, of the five-year-old. And all this research, again, particularly marketing research, has shown this. There was a French psychologist. He actually may be an evil person who worked for marketing companies. And he did this really cutting-edge research where he cut deep into people's psychologies in ways that might have been unethical. Um, but one of the things he said is for Folgers Coffee, that when he really, really talked to people about coffee, what they remembered was the smell of the coffee when they were children. And that's what you wanted to communicate to people. Because that, at the very deepest level, that was what was there. Everything else was just surface noise. Ah, that, that smell of the coffee your parents made when you were a kid. And they said it was really hard to market to people who didn't have coffee around when they were kids because they couldn't, they couldn't tap into that, that smell history. And so it's there. And, and, and if you're born someplace that doesn't drink coffee or if you're born someplace that drinks, you know, mint tea or sweet tea or all these just insignificant patterns and really patterns get laid down and they don't vanish. They're there. And so we move forward in the world with that. And then we develop more and more and more. And then about the time we hit 16, 15, 14, we begin to develop the capacity to reason, which manifests itself as going looking around the world and going, hey, wait a second. Wait one moment. I'm beginning to think this is, is different than I might have suspected. Once you say that, you're in the land of weight, weigh, or measure. Not just what do you think is important, but how do you want the world to be? And, and this is, creates all kinds of problems for us. And generally, so then we're in the, the realm of truth, but again, I want to do small t truth. Let's avoid ontology. Many enter, none return from the swamp of ontology. So we're going to just sort of skate about that. But generally, when we're trying to work with truth, there's a couple of models, the Aristotelian early model, which was correspondence. Something is true if it corresponds well with reality, which makes sense, right? It's truish. If you think, oh, that parking spot is open, and you drive it, and there's a car there, and you smash it, Right? You're, you had a low correspondence. Mm -hmm. If it is open and you park successfully, it's a, it's, a, it's a perfect correspondence. So that's a good one. It works for you. Another model is the notion of coherence, that we want the world to be coherent. And we don't really care about correspondence so much as long as it's internally coherent to our mental system. It needs to correspond a little bit, but as long as it's coherent and we can understand the narrative, that's great. And these models and some others have been duking it out. But what really goes on, and this is perfectly clear again, is that we use all of the above. We want the world to be coherent, and it needs to correspond. And sometimes when our correspondence is low, but it threatens our coherence, we ignore that. 
So if we have a, a theory about ourselves, and there's evidence that suggests that might not be true, I'm the world's greatest basketball player, I never win any basketball games, ah, right, that low correspondence, I can overlook that, people are brilliant at this. We're really good at ignoring low correspondence moments when they compete with the narratives that we tell us. When they challenge our coherence. But if your coherence is sufficiently inaccurate, then you're moving to the world of false correspondence and it will damage you. And so we're always negotiating between the co coherent narrative I'm trying to tell myself about the world and the evidence and the problems and the facts that we're encountering. And we're juggling this furiously. Again, a great quote from William James. Uh, the most violent revolutions in an individual's belief leave most of his old order standing. Time and space, cause and effect, nature and history, and one's own biography remain untouched. New truth is always a go-between, a smoother over of transition. It marries old opinion to new fact, so as ever to show a minimum jolt and a maximum continuity. So when something happens, when our coherence breaks down so badly with correspondence that we have to change, we tend to go for minimum possible change. I can't believe in the Catholic Church anymore, I'll become an Episcopalian. <laughs> right? That, this is absolutely true. If you look at the patterns of this is what people do. Ah, that's Catholic Church, no, Episcopalian. <coughs> right? And it's like, wow. That's, but notice that's sort of, a, roughly speaking, the minimum change you can make and keep everything else orderly. This is, this is a, it go back, uh, it's, it's the gay marriage debate, which I think is great. I think, I don't understand, actually I never understood why it was a debate. But the flip side of the gay marriage debate is, oh, just because I'm homosexual doesn't mean I don't want to fill all the other narratives of my culture. I want the minimum possible disturbance. The way to get the minimum possible disturbance is in every other way to try and believe that I'm just like everybody else. It's just this light. and because and that that's that's the magic that's the magic ticket right minimum possible disturbance now the problem with this is now I mean this is basically what we do the challenge this creates is the tension between the individual and the society is always huge one thing we do is we underrate uh, vastly the incredible disparity of the human species individual to individual we are in incredibly, incredibly diverse people. If you don't believe me, turn on cable TV. There's 120 channels, or 200, or 300. I can never figure out anybody watches any of it, but that's beside the point. People do watch it, so that makes me an outlier in one direction. But somebody wants to watch car racing. Car racing, for God's sakes. Car racing, okay, fine. <laughs> somebody else wants to watch uh, cattle auctions. Somebody else wants, wants a show where they sell you stuff. Or a murder mystery, or a movie. I mean, look at just the range. I mean, it's, it's spectacular. You would think we would have like 10 channels and that would be good enough. No, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of channels. And then go to YouTube, right? Someone on YouTube is building a model of whatever the, the the United States out of string cheese, one-to-one -one scale, you know? And you're like, okay, sure, why not? That's great, they seem happy, so good on them, you know, but it's just, because we're so diverse. But again, as we've mentioned before, society has to organize us and we need to live in society. So we have this necessary tension. And we don't generally have good approaches on how to resolve it. And as we've moved out of a world of material constraint, which is where we started at the beginning of this, of this series, we no longer live in a world of material constraint. When you live in a world of material constraint, your opportunities for self-expression become dramatically lower. If you don't have education, your opportunities for self-expression, self-exploration, dramatically lower. If people kill you for dressing incorrectly, as has been true through much of human history, death penalty for dressing incorrectly because it would, it would be, you're an imposter. You're pretending to be a noble or a merchant when in fact you're a carpenter. Death penalty. 
right? We don't live in that world anymore. Uh, and so we're stuck with all this horrible freedom. What the hell are we going to do with it? And it creates an immense amount of anxiety because we can feel the tension and we don't know how to address it. Um, and so that's what I want to turn to now. Here's the problem. Now, what do we do about it? One, um, something that's, as far as I can tell, almost completely overlooked now is this question of efficacy. I like the word efficacy. There's, I put a definition there. Um, capacity for producing a desired result or effect effectiveness. As much as we've advanced in our world, where we've gone backwards is efficacy. If you're in a tribe, small group, everybody has to perform or people die. Not just you, you threaten the whole group. We're invested in you being successful, in you making things happen, and you being great. We want you to be great because it helps everybody. When you live in a materially constrained world, what you do matters. If you can make a chair, you're a valuable person. If you can help, you know, this is why if you ever watch, you know, nature shows or whatever, they always show, you know, villages in Africa or in South America or wherever. And it's like kids like four years old and they're out herding cattle or something. And we're like, oh my God, how can they do that? It's like, no, no, no. That's great. That kid knows they have e efficacy. They matter. They need to herd the cattle. They're contributing. They're valuable at four or five or six. And that has been the history of mankind. What you did mattered. That's why they were so controlling of people. We don't want you to mess up because you threaten everybody, directly or indirectly. Fast forward to today, we steal efficacy from people. Take kids, young kids, you put them in school, and you tell them this isn't the real world, what you're doing doesn't really matter. But you have to do it, right? This is the message. So you steal from them any sense that they matter. What I'm doing doesn't really matter. School's not the real world. If I do really well, I get an A. If I do sort of well, I get an A. If I show up to class, I get a B plus and pass. If I do anything but light the school on fire, I seem to be fine. So it doesn't matter whether I do well or poorly with an incredibly broad range. Excellence is not particularly rewarded because everybody moves forward. No sense that what you do matters. And then if you, if, you, if you get a job when you're young, we say, oh, well, these are, you get these meaningless jobs. We pay you poorly. Nobody gives you any respect. You don't matter. You have no efficacy. Then you get older and you go off to college maybe. And they go, oh, well, college isn't the real world either. Now you're just waiting to get a job. Plus you're in a costed environment, you're getting money from outside, maybe your parents or the government's paying your way. And so, you know, you're not, you don't, we're protected, you don't really, that's what we tell people, this is the narrative. Wait till you get out in the real world. Well, if you wait for 30 years to get in the real world and your entire life people have been telling what you do, do does not matter, what you think is what you do does not matter, no matter what you do at this point. Why would you? Why would you think, I have efficacy, I have power, I have capacity? And when you rob people of that opportunity, you take their opportunity to begin to judge the world for themselves. And notice when there's no failure or success, you need both, you get no feedback from the correspondence theory of truth. Whatever you do, you don't get the, the failure that says, don't do that. And you don't get the success that says, do that. You get this, bleh. I do this and I get, bleh. Could be okay, could be not so okay, okay. So, and so all you're left with is the coherence theory of truth. And so you're looking at your narratives and comparing them to other people's narratives. And it, it, it's, it creates this really, I think, psychologically damaging environment because you have such a low opportunity to test with correspondence. By the way, this is part of the, oh, we want to keep kids safe. Don't let them do that. Don't let them do this. Don't let them do that. I mean, safety is okay, but breaking your arm is good too. 
It really is. It's really a valuable thing to break your arm, lose an eye, cut off a finger. <laughs> Truly, I'm not mad. I'm, not, I'm, I'm serious. It's educational. If you break your arm, you know what it feels like to break your arm. Like all this fear about the physical world probably goes away. If you get lost in the woods, hey, great. You know, and, and, and we, we don't like that because like, oh, but think of you get really positive correspondence feedback. I thought I knew what I was doing. It turns out I don't. I thought I could climb that tree. Oh, I was wrong. <laughs> You know, and, 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 and on and on. Or I thought, I thought I could swim the lake, and I can. I made, I can swim the lake. That, the power, that power feedback, hey, I'm, I'm stronger than maybe I even thought I was. That's great. You know, and that, so that sense of getting some correspondence feedback to, to work with your sense of a coherent narrative is, is immensely valuable, and it's, we've so diluted this. Like I said, what's to, dis, despairing to me is even when you see people working and we tell them their work does not matter, right? You're a minimum wage worker, we're not going to give you any training, you learn nothing, and we just replace you. I was talking to my, uh, my mother-in-law, and she said when she was growing up, um, you, to work at McDonald's, you had to have a 3.0 GPA or they wouldn't hire you. And everybody who worked there wore their uniforms because you had such a sign of respect that you had achieved the opportunity to work at McDonald's. Right? So notice, this is not the work itself. It's the way the work is perceived, the way the narrative is explained to you. Are you valuable or are you worthless? If you tell people they're worthless all the time and give them no opportunity to, to validate that they do have some value, they don't feel very good about themselves. So this is that important notion of efficacy. So now when you try to create values, a couple of things that have to happen if it's going to come from inside out. First thing you have to do is you have to limit in some way the outside in is just a slider. If you're overwhelmed with input all the time, you cannot process it because you're just a human being. You have a limited about to think about, ingest, ruminate on, and go good, bad, indifferent, not for me, great for me, no, yes. Fortunately, we live in a society in which we have almost no external stimuli and loads of time for self-reflection. <laughs> right? No, of course not. No. So uh, one, one, one sort of problem with our material wealth is that we're inundate, inundated with stimuli, disoriented, one might say, by the amount of information, images, ideas, concepts, music, sound, objects, technology that just pours in on us. And we're told that is great. Now to have the opportunity to sample that is great. But to have no means of filtering it for ourselves is terrible. Because you can't, you, you can't think, by the way. If you, if you read George Orwell's brilliant 1984, one of his key concepts is that, yeah, they just beam the TV at you 24 hours a day and you can never think. He thought that was really the sign that would, everything had gone to hell. And that a totalitarian state would have to be there to enforce it. And I thought, no, no, no. Look, we volunteer. We love it. We pay for it. We pay a lot of money. My phone subscription, cable subscription, satellite, TV, internet, we, woo! It's expensive. I gotta work a lot to be able to afford to keep myself from thinking. Because <laughs> that's just not free. See, he thought you needed police with guns and people toward, no, no. All carrot, no stick. Right, that's, that's where, it's, where it's both a brilliant novel and also just exactly wrong. It didn't take a stick at all. We were desperate for it. We want to live in 1984 so bad we can't stand it. But where he is right is, of course, it just completely eliminates your capacity to think for yourself. 
It's just too much. It's not, you know, people like propaganda and all this. Sure, yes, whatever. But it's, it's just quantity. When, when you're inundated with that much, you, don't, you can't decide. You can't take it in. You don't know what it means because there's no possible way to think about it when, it when it comes in that quickly. Um, because I'm a huge fan of the NFL, talking about stupid stimuli, uh, 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 they always ask coaches after the game, I don't know why they do this, but they always ask the coaches, they said, what do you think of this particular play? And the coach invariably says, it's sort of like, I think it has a certain religious, like, choral response thing. They, they, the reporters ask, and then they respond in this sort of formal dance. It's, it's beautiful in a way. Um, but they say, so they say, oh, what do you think of this particular play? And the coach says, well, I don't know, I'll have to watch the film. And this frustrates people because they say, well, you saw the play. And what the coaches mean is they say, they mean this. They say, look, no, we don't know until I sit down and watch the film to figure out what happened. I don't know what's going on. So here's someone who spent their entire life doing this, who just watched the game and says, I will not understand the game until I've spent several hours, in fact, days, re-watching it and thinking about it. Then I'll know what happened. Because that's how long it takes me, a professional, trained incredibly well to do this job, to do the job right. Days, hours. Uh, but everyone, no one wants to believe that. Like, oh no, he must know. They must know. I know because I just watched the game. Also notice that it suggests we don't know nearly as much. Right? People say, oh, you know, have you read this book? Sometimes I have, sometimes I haven't. And they say, yeah, or, or people say, well, how long does it take you to read a book? And I say, well, it depends on the book. A day, a week, a month, years. There are books that I've been reading for years and years. I keep reading them and rereading them. It takes me forever to read that book. I'll never finish it. Because there's just so much there. Um, and it'll be different books for different people. But the notion that you can just sit down, or some books you can just sit down and read, but a lot of books you just... You know, you read a paragraph, you put it aside, you think about it for a year or two, and then you come back, okay, I'm ready for the next paragraph, right? It's just, you know, you need to get your mind around it. It's difficult, it's a challenge. So first, you have to limit external stimuli in some way. You have to choose what is coming in and how much. And it may be that how much is more important than what. I mean, it, it seems like you want quality, which we'll talk about in a second, but I think it may also just be, if you, it's just mass, sheer volume. So if you've turned down the volume a little bit to where you have some time to think, the second question is then quality. What is it you want in your mind? This Again, this is from the outside in at the moment. Well, if, if, if we talk about food, because Americans, we love diets, because we don't know how to eat, by the way. Something you know we've lost is capacity to know how to eat. And so we always talk about diets, different diets, but we do recognize that it seems to matter what food you eat. We've got that far. But as far as I can tell, we don't think about that in any other way. What I see, what paintings do I look at, what art do I expose myself, what music do I listen to, isn't that also shape my mind? Answer, yes, to a dramatic degree. What environments am I exposed to? What people? What ideas? So when you read a book, you're reading somebody else's ideas. Notice this is already a challenge to the notion of out, inside out. But it's good to consult other people. And since we have this capacity to consult some of the great minds who have ever lived throughout human history, it seems reasonable to do so. The downside of this is, one, they're really powerful minds. That's why they've been selected and survived. And so now you're wrestling with a really powerful mind. It's very easy to be overwhelmed by them. I know very well, let me tell you. Because they're big and strong. And so you don't want too much of that. Even the really high quality stuff, like, wow, just let me play a little bit of Kant goes a long way. <laughs> you know, Aristotle, Socrates, all of them, you can only take in so much before you'll just, you, they just overwhelm you. And so it's, quality matters, but also in the sense of, well, just what is it you want in your mind? 
How much time do you want to have your mind reflecting on, say, beautiful things? Right? I, I, it's not a question I think we ask, even though clearly this is probably makes you healthier the more beauty you reflect on, at least to a certain extent. And at the same time, you're not looking at ugly things. So sort of, you know, so why not expose ourselves to more beautiful and less ugly? And, and again, like music, I love music, but we're inundated with music. Good Lord, they pipe music in everywhere. I'm never sure why this is, but it will keep us from thinking, of course. We know why, 1984. Um, but that means that we don't really hear music a lot because we hear it all the time, if that makes sense. But I, I, I like to do experiments. So here's an experiment you can run is try and listen to no music for a week and then put some music on. It's a completely different experience. Because one of the things you'll start thinking about during that week is what music do I want to hear? Really want to hear. Right? It focuses the mind. It's a very different experience when it's not constantly on us and piped into the grocery store or wherever. And then when we hear it, wow, that's amazing. And so there is this notion of, one, okay, you've got to limit quantity. Two, think about quality. And I'm all for junk food, by the way. Read a trashy novel, watch a stupid TV show, listen to some bad music. That's great. But how much? And why? Makes you feel good, helps you relax? Great, go for it. But again, how much? So then inside out, now this is where it gets really challenging. How do you know what is inside of you? And how do you know whether what's inside of you is you or something that has been smuggled in by your culture, for instance, when you were seven and were too young to know any better? Answer, you don't till you start sorting through it. Think of it as... It's, it's, I, I was trying to ponder something. Just think of it as that you have this massive warehouse full of stuff. Some of it's yours. Some of it, you know, where the hell it came from. But now you've got to go through it. You don't have to go through it. You have the opportunity to go through it. And to reshape it into something you, you, you might like. Throwing out some things, keeping some things. Deciding what's valuable and useful. Citing what's harmful or at least just cluttering the place up, even if it's perfectly nice in every other way. Um, and that sorting process, I think, is helped immensely if it's sorted against some, again, value. If you say, okay, first I want to sort for all those things that I think, for instance, uh, bring me health. Or those things that bring me joy. Or those things that inspire me. Let's do that one. Let's say the inspire. Like, I want to look through myself inside and go, okay, what do I have around here that, that makes me inspired? That gives me that little spark of zuzz. Where did that come from? Is it good for me? Now notice what we tend to say is, um, you should be inspired by these things. Well, you might not be inspired by them. Well, they'll tell you what you're supposed to be inspired by. But that might not be for you. I'm not a big traveler, which is to put it mildly. Uh, but I was talking to, to somebody one time, and he's talking about flying someplace. And I said, oh, God, I hate to fly. I hate to get on planes. All those people, you're like cow and a thing. And I was, you know, the whole rant about airports and blah. And he's like, oh, my gosh. When I get on that plane... And I feel those jet engines start to turn and it takes off from the ground. I feel like I am on the spear tip of human history. All science, <laughs> technological development has been liberating me from space and time so that I can travel anywhere with these incredibly powerful engines. And I'm just like, I am the greatest thing that it's ever lived. And I was like, holy shit, that guy should travel. <laughs> Right? So most people will say, oh, I love to travel, but you know, I don't, the, the air part of it, I don't like, right? 
Or other people say, oh, I don't like to travel because I don't like the airport. He actually finds the act of being on the plane inspirational. Like, that is great. Good for him. But notice that that is not the narratives that we're told. And this, again, is the coherence theory. We try to make the universe coherent to us, usually by importing external narratives. And that's where we go wrong. The most extreme and I think poisonous and sort of contemporary example that I can think of this is the whole transgender movement. And I'm totally in favor of wanting people to do whatever they want, knock yourselves out. I'm great with it. But what I see is happening, what I think causes immense pain and unnecessary suffering, is somebody who's born biologically male or female receives a narrative from their society that says, this is the way you should feel because you're a male or because you're a female. And they don't feel that way. And they think, the way I feel is wrong, I need to change my physical body. This is exactly the wrong way around. No, your cultural narrative is wrong. You're not wrong. You're right. You're incredibly right. You can't not be right if you're in your biological self. How you feel is how you are, and you are right. And so that incredible poison that society tries to foist off on people and say, if you're a man and you want to wear lipstick, oh, you must be a woman. No, the history of men wearing lipstick goes all the way back. Alcibiades, one of my favorite people from history, he was the man. He was great. He was incredible. I love Alcibiades. He was super fabulous. He was absolutely off the charts fabulous. Uh, also slightly nuts and dangerous, but love this guy. Right? You know, was he a woman? Was he a man? Was, no, he was Alcibiades. He never asked that question. He's like, no, I, I don't care. I'm trying to seduce Socrates. He keeps turning me down. I sleep with everybody else. Beautiful wives, beautiful mistresses. I try to conquer Greece. They kick me out. So I try to conquer someplace else. They kick me out. I'm back at Greece. I'm fighting the Persians. Now I'm with the Persians fighting the Greeks. Now I'm, you know, he was, only, he was just, woo, I'm Alcibiades. He didn't think, oh, I'm in the wrong body. No, he was right, because he was him, or her, or it, or whatever it was. He was Alcibiades. And so when we internal, but this is painful, by the way. That's why I, I bring this up, because I think it is a source of real human suffering, is that tension that people feel between being told they are wrong in the world. They need to internalize the societal narrative to the extent that they need to alter their physical bodies. And, and that's just a, the extreme version. And we all struggle with that to lesser and lesser degrees because we don't have our internal measuring sticks. And this is the core of it. This is what we have to do. You have to come up with some measuring sticks from inside of you, like Langston Hughes, that says, all of this other stuff I'm letting go of, not Walt Whitman, because Walt Whitman. That I'm taking to Africa with me. Uh, you know, what is it for you? And no one can tell you this is the problem. No one can say, you know, yeah, I want to make a one-to-one -one model of string cheese of the United States, right? <sighs> Either crazy or genius if it's good for you. If this comes from inside out, right. Uh, and, and by the way, part of the problem here is we are brilliant at retroactive justification. So someone is crazy right until they're successful. <laughs> then we say they're brilliant. Right? And so they suffer the pain of swimming upstream, of being bombarded from external, of having to fight their way out of these processes. And as soon as they achieve anything, if they ever do, people go, oh, you're great. This, by the way, throws people off. Like, what are you talking about? You've been hating me my whole life. I've been like, no one will talk to me. All of a sudden, I'm great. Go away. This is, not, not, this is another kind of poison. Oh, we're changing the narrative on you again. Because now you're whatever, some, some sort of success, some sort of acceptance. Now we want you, so it's okay. Right? And so, but that is the core struggle, and there's no way around it. And I, and I wish I could say, here's the magic thing to do. But if you can begin to come up with some measures, some guidelines, some rules for yourself, from yourself, 
and then test them out. Put them on the scale. That is you. And go, you know, if I stop watching football, I feel better. My mind is more at ease. I have more time to do things I would rather do. Or my life has no meaning. I become suicidal. Right? No, that wouldn't happen. Uh, but, right, right, that's just, just you know, that, but, but is it how, how, you know, how do you know? You don't know. This is the problem. You don't know until you try an experiment because you've been filled from the outside in your whole life and are still being inundated. And so try to swim through that to find what's me, what's not me, but works for me, what's a high correspondence with reality, what doesn't work at all. It's, it's a project, and not a simple project. We've all had to do some of it in our lives just to get by to where we are. But it, you know, I would suggest it's a never-ending project, one you want to keep working on until you have really clear and strong guidelines, until you can stand there with a, with a suitcase full of books going, not for me, not for me, not for me, not for me, this one is for me. Or, 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 or a bunch of people in your life and finally go around and go, no, no, yes, no, yes, no, 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 yes. <laughs> Maybe. Right? You know, that's that. But, we, but that's not what we tend to do. We tend to take it as it is and it will go along and all this. And it doesn't mean being a bastard or being crazy or anything. Because I think generally people want to get along with other people. Generally you don't want to be crazy, outcast, nuts. I think it's one of the lies that we're told is, oh, if you really express yourself, you'll run naked around with a chainsaw and kill people. It's like, what? <laughs> if everybody let go of their inner self, you know, it'd be chaos. There's, there's no evidence. We, people don't necessarily like chaos. We like order. We like finely made pastries. You know, we, 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 th these things that come from civilization and culture and, and people being in communities. We love this stuff. There's no evidence that people left to their own devices without external regulation and, and these repressive narratives will suddenly go mad. Now, we might get difficult to organize. That's different, <laughs> right? Because people are going to go, oh, I want this, or I don't want that, or this is, you know, I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to go over there. Okay, great, everybody. But it's, but it's harder to get us to group up when we do this, which is not necessarily a bad thing, I would say. I'm always suspicious of large groups. Um, you know, that, that sort of narrative. But it, it is the project that has to be done. And so when you think about the transvaluation of all values, do not look outside. And it's okay to reference outside. Again, consult other people. Look at the big world. But mostly, you have to look inside and say, what at the end of the day for me is the most valuable? what really matters to me, and then begin to try to judge things against that. And, and, and that's the final word I want to throw at you, because I know judgment has this bad connotation. You cannot weigh, you cannot have values without judgment. Judge aggressively. Judge consistently. Because th there's no other way to do it. Have a measure. Weigh against it. And then you can know. If you don't, it's going to be external. There's no other, there's just, you know, it's sort of a slider. And it's not, and to wrap up, it's not final perfect liberation. That's silly. We're not after that. But it is a continual process of growth, self discovery, self rediscovery. As we grow and change, by the way, these measures can move in, in a way to engage the world. And, and why? That's the real answer, I'll say. We'll finish with it. It's going to be part of the conclusion next time. Why do all this? Ah, in a world where the values are changing, it's highly disorienting, as we're all experiencing, I think, culturally. Look around. You see the disorientation going on. And you basically have limited choices. It's much more grounding. You will feel much better if you orient yourself Eventually, culture will reorient itself. This always happens. You can look at history, times of devaluation and, and sort of relative chaos, followed by classical periods when things are moderately orderly. But that new order may have nothing good to do with you. It may not be an order you like. It may be an order that helps you. Much better, 
to adjust to a world that's changeable and moving, particularly as fast as ours is, when you have some place to stand that's your own. That you can say, this is me, this is mine, this is how I operate, now let's interact with the world. Now let's see what we can get done. Now let's see what works. See how well I can grow, see how well I can function. Because all of that out there is super changeable and you don't control it or much of it. Lots of this inside is yours and you can control it and it gives you that sense of efficacy and power and engagement in the world that just makes it much easier to deal with a world that's, you know, sort of all the values are changing around you. So transvaluation of knowledge, weight, weigher, and measure. Thank you very much.